Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard, our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, blessings in Jesus, friends. Grace and peace be unto you. We are continuing our study through the book Absolute Surrender by Andrew Murray, and today we're picking up in chapter 2, and we're continuing through chapter 2, so this will be chapter 2b. Now, last we were together, we discovered that the fruit of the Spirit is love, and we expounded on that topic. Today, we want to pick up with love is God's gift. Once again, the author says, I ask, why must this be so? And my answer is, without this, we cannot live the daily life of love. How often when we speak about the consecrated life, we have to speak about temper. And some people have sometimes said, you make too much of temper. Why well, do not think we can make too much of it? Think for a moment of a clock and what its hands mean. The hands tell me, what is within the clock. And if I see that the hands stand still or that the hands point wrong or that the clock is slow or fast, I say that something inside the clock is not working properly. And temper is just like the revelation that the clock gives. It tells us what is within. Temper is a proof whether the love of Christ is filling the heart or not. How many there are who find it easier in church or in prayer meeting, or in work for the Lord, diligent, earnest work, to be holy and happy than in the daily life with wife and children and servant. They find it easier to be holy and happy outside the home than in it. Where is the love of God? In Christ. God has prepared for us a wonderful redemption in Christ, and he longs to make something supernatural of us. Have we learned to long for it, to ask for it, to plead for it, and to beg for it, and expect it in its fullness? Then there is the tongue. We sometimes speak of the tongue when we talk of the better life and the restful life. But just think what liberty many Christians give to their tongues. They say, I have a right to think what I like. When they speak about each other, when they speak about their neighbors, when they speak about other Christians, how often there are sharp remarks. God keep me from saying anything that would be unloving. God shut my mouth if I am not to speak in tender love. But what I'm saying is a fact. How often there are found among Christians who are banded together in work, sharp criticism, sharp judgment, hasty opinion, unloving words, secret contempt of each other, and secret condemnation of each other. Oh, just as a mother's love covers her children and delights in them and has the tenderest compassion with their foibles or failures, so there ought to be in the heart of every believer a motherly love toward every brother and sister in Christ. Have you aimed at that? Have you sought it? Have you ever pleaded for it? Jesus Christ said, As I loved you, so you love one another. And he did not put that among the other commandments, but he said, in effect, that is a new commandment, the one commandment, love one another as I have loved you. It is in our daily life and conduct that the fruit of the Spirit is love. From that fruit love, there comes all the graces and virtues in which love is manifested. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, no sharpness or hardness in your tone, no unkindness or selfishness, meekness before God and man. You see that all these are the gentler virtues. I have often thought as I read those words in Colossians 3.12, which says, Put on, therefore, 
as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindnesses, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. As I read these words, I often think that if we had written this command, we should have put in the foreground the manly virtues such as zeal, courage, and diligence. But we need to see how the gentler, the most womanly virtues are especially connected with dependence upon the Holy Spirit. These are indeed heavenly graces. They never were found in the heathen world. Christ was needed to come from heaven to teach them to us. Your blessedness is long-suffering, meekness, kindness. Your glory is humility before God. The fruit of the Spirit that he brought from heaven out of the heart of the crucified Christ and that he gives us in our hearts is first and foremost love. You know what John says, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. That is, we cannot see God. But as a compensation, we can see our brother. And if we love him, God dwells in us. Is that really true? That I cannot see God, but I must love my brother and God will dwell in me? Loving my brother is the way to real fellowship with God. You know what John further says in the most solemn test in 1 John 4.20, If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? There is a brother, a most unlovable man. He worries you every time you meet him. He is the very opposite disposition to yours. You are a careful businessman, and you have to do with him in your business. He is most untidy, unbusinesslike. You say, I cannot love him. Oh, friend, you have not learned the lesson that Christ wanted to teach above everything. Let a man be what he will. You are to love him. Love is to be the fruit of the Spirit all the day and every day. Yes, listen. If a man loves not his brother, whom he hath seen, if you don't love that unlovable man whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? You can deceive yourself with beautiful thoughts about loving God. You must prove your love to God by your love to your brother. That is the one standard by which God will judge your love to him. If the love of God is in your heart, you will love your brother. The fruit of the Spirit will bear it because the fruit of the Spirit is love. And what is the reason that God's Holy Spirit cannot come in power? Is it not possible? You remember the comparison I used in speaking of the vessel. I can dip a little water into a potsherd, a piece of broken glass, but if a vessel is to be full, it must be unbroken. And so the children of God, wherever they come together, to whatever church or mission or society they belong, they must love each other intensely, or the Spirit of God cannot do His work. We talk about grieving the Spirit of God by worldliness and ritualism and formality and error and indifference, but I tell you the one thing about everything that grieves God's Spirit is this want of love. Let every heart search itself and ask that God may search it as well. Why are we taught that the fruit of the Spirit is love? Why is there such emphasis and great importance placed upon it? Because the Spirit of God has come to make our daily life an exhibition of divine power and a revelation of what God can do for His children. In the second and fourth chapters of Acts, we read that the disciples were of one heart and one soul. During the three years they had walked with Christ, they never had been in that spirit. All Christ's teachings could not make them of one heart and one soul, 
but the Holy Spirit came from heaven and shed the love of God in their hearts. And they were immediately of one heart and one soul. The same Holy Spirit that brought the love of heaven into their hearts must fill us too, friends. Nothing less will do. Even as Christ did, one might preach love for three years with the tongue of an angel, but that would not teach any man to love unless the power of the Holy Spirit should come upon him to bring the love of heaven into his heart. Think of the church at large. What divisions among us? Think of the different bodies, the different denominations, the different beliefs. Take the question of holiness. Take the question of the cleansing blood. Take the question of the baptism of the Spirit. What differences are caused among dear believers by such questions? That there are differences of opinions does not trouble me. We do not have the same constitution and temperament. <clears throat> we do not have the same constitution and temperament and mind. But how often hate, bitterness, contempt, separation, and unlovingness are caused by the holiest truths of God's word. Our doctrines, our creeds have been more important than our love. We often think we are valiant for the truth, and we forget God's command to speak the truth in love. And it was so in the time of the Reformation, between the Lutherans and the Calvinistic churches. What bitterness there was then in regard to the Holy Supper, which was meant to be the bond of union among all believers. And so, down through the ages, the very dearest truths of God have become mountains that have separated us. If we want to pray in power, and if we want to expect the Holy Spirit to come down in power, and if we want indeed that God shall pour out his Spirit, we must enter into a covenant with God that we love one another with a heavenly love. Are we ready for that? You see, you must understand, only true love, heavenly love, divine love, Spirit-filled love is large enough to take in all of God's children, even the most unloving and unlovable and unworthy and unbearable and trying. If our vow is absolute surrender to God, if that is true, then it must mean absolute surrender to the divine love to fill us, to be a servant of love, to love every child of God around us. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. Oh, friends, God did something wonderful when he gave Christ at his right hand, the Holy Spirit to come down out of the heart of the Father and his everlasting love. And how we have degraded the Holy Spirit into a mere power by which we have to do our work. God forgive us. Oh, that the Holy Spirit might be held in honor as a power to fill us with the very life and nature of God and of Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is love. I ask once again, why is it so? And the answer comes, that is the only power in which Christians really can do their work. Yes, it is that we need. We want not only love that is to bind us to each other, but we want a divine love in our work for the lost around us. Do we not often undertake Christian work because our minister or friend calls us to it? And do we not often perform Christian work with a certain zeal, but without having had a baptism of love? People often ask, what is the baptism of fire? I have answered more than once. I know no fire like the fire of God, the fire of everlasting love that consumed the sacrifice on Calvary. The baptism of love is what the church needs. And to get that, we must begin at once to get down upon our faces before God in confession and plead, Lord, let love from heaven flow down into my heart. 
I am giving up my life to pray and live as one who has given himself up for the everlasting love to dwell in and fill him. Ah, oh, yes, friends, if the love of God were in our hearts, what a difference it would make. There are hundreds of believers who say, I work for Christ, and I feel I could work much harder, but I have not the gift. I do not know how or where to begin. I do not know what I can do. Brother, sister, ask God to baptize you with the spirit of love, and love will find its way. Love is a fire that will burn through every difficulty. You may be a shy, hesitating person who cannot speak well, but love can burn through everything. God fill us with love. We need it for our work. You have read many a touching story of love expressed, and you have said how beautiful. I myself heard one not long ago. A lady had been asked to speak at a rescue home where there were a number of poor women. As she arrived there and got to the window with the matron, she saw outside a wretched object sitting and asked, Who is that? The matron answered, She has been into the house 30 or 40 times, and she has always gone away again. Nothing can be done with her. She is so low and so hard. But the lady said, she must come in. The matron then said, We have been waiting for you, and the company is assembled, and you only have an hour for the address. The lady replied, No, this is of more importance. And she went outside where the woman was sitting and said, My sister, what is the matter? I am not your sister, was the reply. Then the lady laid her hand on her and said, Yes, I am your sister, and I love you. And so she spoke until the heart of the poor woman was melted. The conversation lasted some time, and the company were waiting inside patiently. Ultimately, the lady brought the woman into the room. There was the poor, wretched, degraded creature, full of shame. She would not sit on a chair, but she sat down on a stool beside the speaker's seat and she let her lean against her with her arms around the poor woman's neck while she spoke to the assembled people. And that love touched the woman's heart. She had found one who really loved her, and that love gave access to the love of Jesus. Praise God, there is love upon earth in the hearts of God's children. But oh, that there were more. Oh, God, baptize our ministers with a tender love and our missionaries and every soul winner, every Bible reader, every Christian worker. Oh, that God would begin with us now and baptize us with heavenly love. Once again, it is only love that can fit us for the work of intercession. I have said that love must fit us for our work. Do you know what the hardest and the most important work is that has to be done for this sinful world? It is the work of intercession, the work of going to God and taking time to lay hold on Him. A man may be an earnest Christian, even an earnest minister, and a man may do good, but alas, how often he has to confess that he knows but little of what it is to tarry with God. May God give us the great gift of an intercessory spirit, a spirit of prayer and supplication on behalf of a lost and dying world. Let me ask you in the name of Jesus not to let a day pass without praying for all saints and for all God's people. I find there are Christians who think little of that. I find there are prayer unions where they pray for the members and not for all believers. I pray you, take time to pray for the church of Christ. It is right to pray for the heathen, as I've already said. God help us to pray more for them. It is right to pray for missionaries and for evangelistic work, and even for the unconverted. But Paul did not tell people to pray for the heathen or the unconverted. 
Paul told them to pray for believers. Do make this your first prayer every day. Lord, bless thy saints everywhere. The state of Christ's church is indescribably low. Plead for God's people that he would visit them. Plead for each other. Plead for all believers who are trying to work for God. Let love fill your heart. Ask Christ to pour it out afresh into you every day. Try to get it into you by the Holy Spirit of God. I am separated unto the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. God help me to understand it. May God grant that we learn day by day to wait more quietly upon him. Do not wait upon God only for yourself, or the power to do so will soon be lost. But give yourself up to the ministry and the love of intercession, and pray more for God's people, for God's people all around you, for the spirit of love in yourself and in them, for the work of God that you are connected with and the answer will surely come, and your waiting upon God will be a source of untold blessing and power, for the fruit of the Spirit is love. Have you a lack of love to confess before God? Then make confession and say before Him, O Lord, my lack of heart, my lack of love, I confess it. And then as you cast that lack at His feet, Believe that the blood cleanses you, that Jesus comes in his mighty, cleansing, saving power to deliver you, and that he will give you his Holy Spirit. He will give you his love. And that brings us to the end of chapter two today, friends. Next time we'll pick up together chapter three, which is titled Separated Unto the Holy Ghost. Now, my prayer for you is that as you continue in your journey, your focus will not be so much centered upon what is happening outside of your body, but all of your focus, all of your attention will be inward, and that through the examination of your heart, you'll learn that the work of the Holy Spirit begins inside, and then after much cleansing, works himself to the outside. May your journey be blessed. May your heart be full of joy and may your lips be full of praise. And in all you do, may you bring much honor, glory, and praise unto our one King, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video. 